Well, praise the Lord and uh, welcome to another lovely Sunday. And uh, God bless and strengthen each one of you as we gather from all over the world in this uh, worship. On Sunday, we have been uh, sharing on the presence of God and we continue in that series. Last week, we talked about the indwelling presence of Christ and how they can work through our lives. Let's continue in reading the book of Ephesians, chapter 3. In Ephesians 3, Paul speaks more of the presence of God in a different dimension in his prayer. In Ephesians 3, Paul speaks about how outstanding uh, revelation of God's dispensation, the grace of God was in the church. He also speaks about the special calling of the church to personify wisdom to all of God's creation. And towards the end of that, he went into a prayer. Within the prayer is more specifics about the presence of God. In verse 14, let's read that prayer. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So this builds upon what we shared the last week about Christ's indwelling presence. And Paul speaks about the indwelling presence within us increasing. Let's continue reading verse 16, that he will grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend. The word comprehend is katalambano, which is meaning to be able to receive with all the saints what? is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Being filled with all the fullness of God is to be filled with God's presence. That being filled with all the fullness of God is tied to the knowledge of the love of God which passes all knowledge. Uh, and he says in verse 20, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we are so think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. So in this little prayer, there is a revelation about that presence of God that can fill us to the fullness. And it's linked to the indwelling presence of Christ. What we can see very clearly from three of the verses is how that presence is tied to the love of God. In verse 17, that presence is tied to how rooted and grounded we are in love. And then in uh, verse 19, it is tied to the knowledge of his love, which passes knowledge. So this 
presence of God that we've been studying for the past Sundays is tied to some sort of a knowledge, some sort of a comprehension, some sort of establishment in the love of God. Now, if it says that we are rooted and grounded in the love of God, does it mean that there are some people who are not rooted and grounded? All they know is a passing knowledge of God's love. To be rooted and grounded is to be like a strong and mighty tree with its roots firmly rooted in the ground of God's love. So some people are not a tree, they're just a shrub. Or they're just a piece of grass that just touch on the love of God. And if you irritate them and you put pressure on them, the love that they claim to have disappears as fast as the hurricane. Whereas people who are grounded in God's love, you can throw all manner of difficulty upon them. But because they are rooted, they're grounded, establishing that love, that love keeps growing. And that's the kind of love that can overcome tribulation, overcome difficulties, overcome the valleys and the mountains that traverse a person's path. Are you grounded in God's love? Or are you just touched by God's love? And in the pressure, the love of God in your life disappears. So it is important that to have this level and this measure God's love that this love that we have passes just normal cognitive understanding is built based upon the depths of our heart in your knowledge as it says immediately we see that there's a link between the strength and the level of God's presence with how deep, how strong we are in that same love. We could put an equation. The presence of God equals the love of God. The more of God's love you have, the more presence of God is within you. And of course, I leave each one of us to define what the presence of God in our life is. For some of us, the presence of God in our life means that the power, the authority of God's kingdom and God's authority rules and reigns in our life with power over demons, power over sickness, power over diseases, power over demons, power the devil, power over natural laws. That's the presence of God within us. So if that manifest presence that all calls it the fullness of God is directly tied to our comprehension, our understanding, our yieldedness, and our rootedness in that same equal love of God. Then it also means that the less loving a person is, the less the presence of God is in them. Because if the level, strength 
of God's presence in our life is directly proportional and equal to the love of God. The less you have the love of God, the less you have the presence of God. The more you are established in the same love, the more the presence of God is in your life. So the next time you take authority of sickness and disease, command demons to leave, exorcise people from demonic influence, think about how much love you have in your life. If you hateful person, angry person, irritable person with no compassion and love, do you think your command would have any authority or life flowing through you? Of course not. If the fullness of God's presence is directly equal to the love of God, then you could measure God's presence. We have something to measure by. How much love of God is in you. That can be measured. Just irritate a person and see whether the love of God still comes up. Because you don't have to purposely do that. But we have a measurement of God's love, of God's life, of God's presence. And indeed, even in the Old Testament where Born again experience is not so much there yet. When they attacked Moses, Moses did not attack back. He was me. That's because he has compassion. In fact, people who attack him, Miriam and Aaron, his own brother. Moses had actually spent 40 days praying for the Israelites who sinned against God in the golden calf. He laid down himself for 40 days and night without food or water. He interceded for the Israelites. And God wanted to kill Aaron and he prayed for Aaron. So the very person he prayed for, redeem and got God's forgiveness was now attacking him. Would Moses say, huh, good riddance with you. You are not worth all the prayers. He never. He was meek. He was humble. He did not speak out against them. It was God who got angry at them. And God punished Miriam. She had leprosy. And Moses had to pray for her to be healed. So was Moses an angry man? No, he, he has a measure of God's compassion and love. I wouldn't say his compassion and, and love was equal to Jesus. But Moses can be irritated then become angry as you saw that when he was asked to speak a second time to the rock, he beat the rock twice in his anger and got punished. But generally, we can say Moses had some measure of love for the people whom he led and for his own family who got irritated at him from time to time. And all the people who exercise God's power and God's presence throughout the Old Testament, New Testament, they had a certain measure of love. But the person who has the most love and who is the personification of the love of God to us is Jesus. 
no one can beat or even reach the level of God's love that Jesus had for us. And thus Jesus has the fullness of the fullness of God's presence because he was filled with God's love. He had the fullness of God's presence and power. If you desire to be a powerful man or woman of God who could stretch your hand and raise the date, who could uh, release resurrection power that pretty miracles can happen, whose word would drive away all sickness and disease, be filled with God's love. And you will be filled with God's presence. Paul mentioned some interesting things in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He says that even if you can speak with tongues, with all men and of angels, and that's a very powerful situation, it will be just sounds without power. So in a way, he's saying, even you have the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but no love, the presence of God in your life is so reduced that the gifts themselves are no benefit to you or to the people you minister to. Imagine having the power to speak all tongues of angels and of men and interpret them. But because you don't have the love of God, that powerful gift is rendered zero in effectiveness. And you could, Paul say, prophesy and know all the mysteries, but you have no love. I've seen Prophets without love. I've seen leaders without love. And then you wonder, aren't these people supposed to be the representations of the God of love? And it would be sad that the higher the person is in the church or in Christianity, the organized church, the less love they have. Which would mean that they actually have less of the presence of God when they should have more of the presence of God. There is an irony that is happening in our modern church that some of the established leaders in authority have so little love. They become exactly like the Pharisees. The Pharisees sit at the highest political power in Israel. At the same time, they sit at the height of the religious organization of Israel. Yet, while outwardly they should have represented the highest authority and power in the land of Israel, in actual fact, because of the lack of love, they represent the least of the presence of God in an organized place. And that will be sad. There are many churches, many organizations who represent the body of Christ. 
And the people in there who should have been the most compassionate, the most loving, the most understanding, have become hypocrites to the Pharisees, whom Jesus say they are like whitewashed tombs. Inside, they are full of decay. But outwardly, they paint themselves to be white. And it is something that Jesus hates. Something that Jesus opposes. So as we present ourselves to people around us, as we represent Jesus in his organized church, let us understand that the true measure of authority, the true measure of how much God's presence is in our lives, is in how much we love. The greater the presence, the greater should be the love of God in our lives. But that is the inconsistency that humans have. Are you a prophet? Are you an apostle? Are you one of the fivefold? Do you consider yourself one of the authorities and representations that God has on the earth to do His will? Then become the most loving. Become the greatest compassion. It is funny that the disciples of Jesus who follow Jesus can get caught up in religiosity. So that sometimes when people are seeking healing like Bartimaeus or uh, the Syrophoenician women, that the disciples themselves I say, put this person away. And then Jesus had to say, bring him to me, bring her to me. And then the children who want being blessed by Jesus, the di disciples stop them from coming to Jesus. And Jesus say, bring them to me. How opposite they are to Jesus. When they should be as loving as Jesus, as compassionate as Jesus, they became the very religious Pharisee-like person who uh, refused a person who needs healing to come to Jesus, a person who is seeking the love of Jesus and they are acting in a most onerous way without love. How can the representatives of Jesus become loveless? Because they become religious. Religious people tend to lose the plot. That the whole purpose of religion is to be like God, to know God. And yet, the lovelessness of the religious community is such that in our history, the most cruel people are religious zealots <clears throat> who kill one another in the name of their faith or religion. How can this be? This is a deception of the devil. And the problem is the pride or quote-unquote rightness that the person feels wrongly in their heart. So your religious people who think it is right to kill another person who doesn't believe in the same way like you. While Jesus came to save, they came to 
kill, quote unquote, purify their religious sect. This is a disgrace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, this move, the higher we grow in God, the more loving we must become. But just as we mentioned that fullness of God equals the love of God. And our second point is that any gift or position God gives to us must also be a measurement of the love that God has given to us. The second point is any position or gifting without love is destructive and useless in themselves. The ability to speak in tongues or many angels is useless. Completely useless. Just a plunging symbol, a noise maker of no benefit to anyone. So, if you're a prophet with a love, you might as well uh, leave the ministry because all your prophecies are useless. All your position is useless. It is how much love that can flow to you that will make your gift and calling beneficial to those whom God called you to go to. So in our second point, as we emphasize here, if we indeed have the gift of God, that gift has to be measured in the love of God for its effectiveness. Now Paul mentions in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Towards the end, he says, Are all apostles? Obviously, no. Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts or healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? And then in verse 31, this is his statement. But earnestly desire the best gifts. And yet, I show you a more excellent way. So what Paul is saying, whatever spiritual position God gave to you, whatever gifts God gave to you, you must function in the love of God for it to be effective. Are you a, a leader who bullies other people? Use your authority, bully people, to take authority over them, to meddle in their affair. You should quit. It's better that you do nothing than do all the nonsense that is without the love of God. We will have to maintain as we are organized and as we release the 10,000 churches and all the 24 hour prison worship a certain standard. And that standard has to be, to be the love of God. But isn't it ironic to find that sometimes the stronger leaders or the supposedly very leaders, less love. And that is a work of the devil. But the work of the Holy Spirit is the higher you are, the greater your love. The closer you are with Jesus, 
the greater your love. The greater the presence of God in your life, the more you are like the Heavenly Father in His love. We must always examine ourselves by the love of God. Just like Jesus says, the greatest among us must be the servant of all. You know what the disciples of Jesus were arguing about? Just as Jesus was about to go to Jerusalem the last time, they were arguing about who among them was the greatest. The very opposite of what they should be doing. And Jesus knew what they were doing. And he took a small child, put him in, mid, in the midst and say, whoever is like this child is like those in the kingdom of God. And then he emphasized to them that being his, his right hand or left hand, being greatest in the kingdom of God, is to serve, not to dominate, not to use a challenge. Are you a person who likes to dominate, suppress, push down, put yourself high among all the people? Then you don't deserve to be a leader. You are not true disciple of Jesus. The measurement is how much love you have. Are you a person who is easily irritated at all the people around you? And you don't deserve to be a leader. Because the more God uses you as a disciple and as a true leader, the more you must tolerate the weaknesses, the irritations of those who can see less than you. And in a sense, being a leader is to be able to put up with all the nonsense of those who are not at your level. You cannot see what you see. It's a part of the kingdom of Jesus and of God. So whatever gifts that you think you have, whatever high callings that you think you have, please grow proportionately in the love of God. Otherwise, you are a cleansing symbol, a prophet without edification. A person of faith without blessings. Like Paul said, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I become a sounding brass or clanging symbol. Though I have the gift of Prophecy, I understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And although I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. At the end of the day, the measurement of our life is how much true love we have for others. True love seeks to help. True love seeks to bless. True love seeks to edify, even at the cost of your own life. A true leader is one who helps everyone first and then finally help themselves. I remember the first uh, the first time we went to Korea 
and for some reason everyone got lost and took us four or five hours instead of just the two hours. By the time we came down through the path, everybody was tired, dusty, and hungry. And I know what the work our leader is. And we managed to get a grocery shop that is nearby at the end of the stop open. And then we started helping because we were very far off from where we started. And I knew straight away what I'm supposed to do. I must help everybody to get back home to their hotel before I myself can go. The prophet just took his family, left, left the people there. I know that that's not the way a true leader functions. So I make sure uh, that we call enough taxis for everyone. And until everybody left, there happened to be a Korean pastor who was there helping. And instead of getting a taxi, he says, let me give you a ride home. In the end, he's a good man and I appreciate his church. But that's the way a leader must behave. If you're the leader and all your sheep need help, you help all of them first before you help yourself. You're like a parent to them. You know, if a family is in need, and they have food on the table, wouldn't the parents let the children eat first before they themselves eat? There are many, many situations where you can exercise the same love that Jesus would have exercised. You know, in any situation through his three years, Jesus always exercised the love of God. And as one of the leaders of those whom God called in this end time, we must show for the same love that Jesus showed us. Always take care of the sheep first and then yourself. Always help others first and then help yourselves. That is an important leadership quality that we look for in our end time leaders. And there will be many situations that present themselves. In so many years of ministry, I'm tired. Five four ministers who bully people, who demand all the attention instead of sacrificing for the sheep. We have enough of these stuff, five four leaders. Let them all crash and burn. Let all these five four be demolished and build a new set of five four leaders who are exactly like Jesus, who would give themselves their lives and all that they have to help others. These are those whom God is raising in a new set of fivefold. The old fivefold is being demolished and burned. New ones are being raised by God. Understand 
that the greater your authority, the greater must be your love. The greatest among us must be a servant of all. And situations present themselves. You don't ask for it, but they always present themselves. So I remember by the time I got home, I yet and ready for bath. And I saw all the people had gone out for their dinner, for their lunch, and I'm happy for them. Because they've been a long, long prayer walk. It was good to see them finally rested. So by the time I bathed and changed in that day, it was so late. And then I then I went out to look for some food, cause some some sort of fried chicken or something on the street. It was good. The gift of God and the position of God God gave to us must cause us to be equal in its power and rank that God gives to us. Rejoice in God's gifting. Rejoice in God's authority. Rejoice in the position God gives to you. But don't use your position to bully others. That's the way of the Gentiles where like Jesus said, they lord over each other and they seek benefits from their position over each other. That's not the discipleship of Jesus. It is, of course, not an easy thing to walk like Jesus. But as long as we always remember Help others before you help yourself. Serve others before you serve yourself. Then you would rise in the position and power that God has given you to its fullness. Besides the Apostle Paul pointing that the gift that God gives to us can be can be increased in a powerful way. He said, this is the best, I show you the best way to do things. The Apostle John mentioned statements in his episode in a way that is, I would say, astounding. And he tells us from his understanding and position. That there is no fellowship if a person does not understand the concept of love. He says in verse 9, he, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 9, He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who abides he who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. He who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. What John is saying is that the moment you don't like or hate another believer, 
You yourself are in darkness. It's a frightening statement. You know, darkness is where the devil and demons abide in. So the true test, not just of the presence of God, but of whether we are in the light of God or in darkness, is whether you have love. He says, if a person hates and instead of love, the person is classified as in darkness. And if a person is in darkness, what right has a person to be in the kingdom of God of light? To be a leader in the kingdom of God? A person is totally in darkness. Now in darkness, you can't see. You're blind. You're deceived. That is why our third point is to truly walk in love. That is when we truly walk in the light. So everyone who does not have love, according to John, he is in darkness. And darkness is where the devil, demons, and all manner of sin and deception and, and terrible things take place. So to be in the love of God is equal to being in light. To not being in the love of God is equal to being in darkness. This is the word of God. God is light. God is love. And the two are one. Love and light are the same attributes. To be in one is to be in the other. To have none is to be in darkness. So the question when it is asked, are you walking in a light or are you walking in darkness? Could be also asked, are you walking in the love of God or are you not walking in the love of God? And of course, no one says that we are all perfect. Or we are all filled with perfect love. Yeah. But as much as we can, as much as God enables us, we must choose to love. And if you have not learned by now, then learn quickly. Love is a choice. When in difficult times, difficult situations, you choose to love, you allow darkness to flee in the light of God to come forth. When we are in the light, we can see clearly. When we are in the light, we can function powerfully. To be in the love of God is to be in the light of God. To be in the light of God is to be in the presence of God. These three words wow. descriptions of the same attribute. Love, light, and life. The life of God. 
is the fullness of God. We can never, ever separate them because there are three different dimensions of the same substance. In John chapter 1, it says, In him was life, and the life was a light of all men. The life of God is the actual light that shines. And the life of God is also the love of God. In this, from now to the catching of the bride of Christ into the mess of the Lamb, we must progress in our uh, in the life of God within us. We must grow. We must also grow in the light of God within us. And we must grow in the love of God. Because heaven is made up of the atmosphere of God's love. The oxygen of heaven is love. If you don't develop into the highest level of God's love, you can never be in the highest realm of heaven. And that's today's lesson that the presence of God is the love of God. We are called to increase our love, to be rooted and grounded in love. When you take a walk in a park, in a garden, or in a forest, you always see these huge trees with great tree trunks. And what is below is as, as deep as what is above. And you look at trees that have been in existence, some for hundred years, some for thousands of years. And you can imagine all that the tree has gone through. When the tree was growing, in a drought, and it was getting as much water as it can through the depths of the soil, through the hot weather, and through the cold, more did the tree endure. And you see some of its powerful roots spreading out all around the tree. You admire what the tree has gone through to be grounded and rooted. The same way, we are like trees of God through decades, through the years, in season and out of season, we were always there with God's light shining to God's people. We are always there with God's love reach out to God's people. We are like a tree that's planted its roots deep in the presence of God's rivers. And as season comes and season goes, we stand in the presence of God. The seasons of the world change. The aspirations of the world change. But we remain the same like a mighty tree. Always speaking God's word. Always giving God's love. Until we can be said that we are rooted and grounded in this love of God.
where our love has been challenged by our enemies and we still love them, by our foes and we still love them. In season and out of season, we have no hatred, but only the love and compassion of God. Let us grow in this love so that we can grow in the same presence. And one fine day, the presence of God will be so great in our life that our living physical bodies are transformed into the resurrection life of God. So every time your love is challenged, is a challenge to the life of God in you, to the light of God in you. Accept the challenge. Choose love. Choose humility. The choice to love is always the right choice. Whatever situation you're in, the choice to love is always the right choice. As you choose love, the life of God increases. And as the life of God increases because the life is the light of all men, your light increases. You become more glorious. You become more transformed. Have you seen what a person looks like when they are without love? Horrible. No matter how pretty or how handsome they were born in. Have you seen what people look like when they're full of God's love? Most beautiful most handsome, the most lovely. For all ladies who love to make themselves beautiful, you are at your most beautiful when you allow the love of God to show through you. No hatred, no badness, no empty love, but just pure love. You are at your most beautiful in spirit, soul, and body when you allow the love of God to flow through you, through your heart, through your thoughts, through your words. And you are at your most transformed, filled with light when you allow the love of God to flow through you. Right now, you can have the center of God's fullness of love by choosing the love of God in your life. Whatever challenges you have. And when God's love prevails, God's presence prevails. When God's presence Prevail. There is nothing in this universe that can defeat you. There's nothing in this whole universe that can overcome you. Because the power of God's love, power of God's light, power of God's presence, equivalent to the presence of God on His throne, is flowing through you. So today we understand that the fullness of God's presence flows through the fullness of His love. And think about it, isn't love a very simple choice? It's just choosing 
to allow the same love of the Father, the same love that Jesus gave to us, to flow through us. And why should it be difficult for you to love? Didn't Jesus love you? Didn't Jesus love me for you when there was ugliness in you? If we will love Jesus unconditionally, we can choose to love unconditionally. And may all of us be rooted and grounded in the love of God. May all of us receive from God the width, the length, the height, and the breadth of God's love. And when God looks at us, God sees a perfect reflection of Himself in us. Because we are full of love, we are full of His presence. And we are full of His light. The greatest light that lights up this universe is the love of God. And when we can love like God loves, and isn't that the challenge in this life? To be able to love like God loves. And when we are able to do so, then the light that flows through us is equal to the love and the light that flows through God on the truth. And we become like in the same light, the same life, the same love. And all the fullness of God. Imagine the fullness of God flow through us while we are on this planet. There is no disease that you couldn't heal. There is no darkness that you couldn't light and shine away. There is no weapon of the devil that you could not overcome. And like God, the light that shines through you will bring Create miracles. One look at the light of God that shines through you will heal a million billion. Blind people, lame people, sick people, oppressed people. And may this love and light and life of God shine through us that we will always bring miracles in every situation that we are in. Amen. Father God, we pray the same prayer that the Apostle Paul prayed for Ephesus. That our Lord Jesus Christ would dwell in each one of these, your people. The presence in dwelling of Christ would dwell in all the spirit beings of your people here gathered in your church and the fullness of Christ in each one of them will cause them to be rooted and grounded and that they will comprehend and receive the width, the length, the breadth, the height of the love of Christ beyond all comprehension, that they may know this high calling of yours, 
who choose to love and let the love of Christ flow through us, who distribute love in this universe, who distribute life in this universe as the trees of life, so that like Jesus, all the works of Jesus and all the glory of Jesus will shine around us, and all the darkness on this earth is healed and driven away. And all around us are miracles upon miracles and signs and wonders of the power of God's love and life. Release this upon each one of our life. Cause within our heart to be birthed the great desire to love like you love, to shine forth like you shine forth. Let it be unto us according to your word and according to the calling you have called us to. In these days of the ten toes, let your kingdom be established. Let the glorious bride of Christ shine in the fullness of your glory without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish. For that is us and who we are. We bless you and praise you, Father God, for transforming every heart and every mind that the attributes of God flow through us and we are seated with Christ in holy places with the same love, power, grace and majesty. Thank you, Father. We are ready for you. We love you. And we bless you. Seal these blessings in each life. May we establish a 24 hour present worship in thousand churches that this world will be filled with the glory of God. We worship you. We thank you, Father. In your heart and your mind, it is done. And we receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. I'll pass back the time to call in for questions and answers. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. So, if you have questions, uh, you can post it in the chat now. You can also unmute yourself to uh, ask the question directly. So, please go ahead. Good morning, Pastor. Praise the Lord. Um, I'm going to have a question that was actually on my mind a long time ago about the presence of God. Um, namely, how does the presence operate when we see it impacting other people around us? For example, they start having unexplainable joy, even when we don't say jokes, they start uh, feeling loved or... Um, so they tap into our presence that we carry. Um, but how do we ourselves can tap into our own presence? As other like unbelievers, they might notice it and the presence impacts them in a positive way. But we ourselves, as we live with that presence every day, we might, or myself, I'm not always conscious of it. And I don't benefit it the same way as the unbelievers when they come in contact with me. So... How do we increase our awareness of that presence ourselves that other people apparently notice? Mm. I describe it like being like the sun. The sun is always shining day and night, and its light is constantly flowing on the earth and all the planets, giving it life. So within us, is this sense of being seated with Christ and being in the throne room, one with Him. And 
sensing this life and love of God flowing everyone around so that everyone is touched at least by another measure of God's love when they are within our presence. And all we sense within us is this extreme love that God has for them. Like light flowing through them. That's what we can meditate on. There is a question coming. Uh, Pastor, I think sometimes church leaders use tough love as an excuse to be only tough. Uh, please touch on the difference between the two. I think what people mean by tough love is making difficult situations, making difficult decisions, in a time that it needs to be done. Uh, tough love can be illustrated by when you make a decision for a child who does not know what it actually needs. And the child might want to eat ice cream, morning, noon, night, supper. But you know that's not good for the child. So when you make a decision for the child saying, no, it won't be good for you, we give you one portion of ice cream and other things in between. Child might cry, child might uh, throw a tantrum, but you're firm. And you say, this is the right thing. So what tough love is, is just doing the right thing the correct thing in the situation when uh, when the child is demanding only one way which is the wrong way. So tough love is doing the correct ethical principle Bible way of right and wrong. Eli is an example of someone who does not know what true love is, he allowed his children, his sons, to commit adultery inside the temple with the women, and he allowed his sons to interrupt the sacrifices being given to God just because they liked their meat in a different way and they didn't allow all of it to be thoroughly offered and burned. And in the end, God was angry at Eli. Angry because he did not discipline his sons when his sons were provoking the holy things. And in the end, Eli got judged and he died. So, that's, these are examples for what Half love is half love is to do the correct thing when the correct thing is not what the child or the person wants. Uh, let's let, look at the next question. Good day, Pastor. You can read this. Out or not, I would like to share my observation in different churches and families here in my country, Philippines. Because you have mentioned earlier about the situation experiencing in Korea, that one of, one of the members left abruptly with his family and left the other members. I do not know him, I don't know the whole situation, but just want to give my opinion of the same situation here in our country. I started at early age of eight, in different churches, different pastors, engineers, doctors, scientists. I'm always adopted by different families, parents, to say for days or weeks in their houses. I've seen and observed the patterns. 
it is repeated in every family that the wives here in my country are always domi dominating the husbands. And the husbands most of the time submits to the decision of the wives. I've observed this for decades in just saying that maybe the husbands want to truly serve God, Yahweh, in the church, but because of the wives insisting their needs and demands, they have been restricted because of the needs of their families. Just want to inform others about this kind of situation in the family. There is a very obvious attack of their enemy. I think Apostle Paul also have observed this situation in the church. That is why he wrote Ephesians 5. Yes, to a certain extent. Let's give some Bible examples. Um, in Abraham and Sarah's situation, Sometimes Abraham is right. Sometimes Sarah is right. And God has told Abraham that at one point when he wanted Hagar to be driven out, Abraham was very sad because he felt all the emotional hurt. But God says Sarah is right. And listen to her. So in that situation, she was right. In another situation, um, where Abraham continued to uh, do the right thing, and uh, that time God did not rebuke him, and he was right. Sarah was reacting. So, in every situation, there is only one right move, or at the most, two or three. We need to bring God into the situation. And that is why the key is what did God say? Not what the wife say, not what the husband say, but what is God saying? And in any situation, if people will allow a time of prayer, a time of waiting on God, I'm sure God would show them what His will is. Next question here. Mm -hmm. Good morning, sir. Would you say the most important virtue a believer can have is the love of God? I would say yes, because you can see that person can have the gift of prophecy, which I interpret all things that Paul said, 1 Corinthians 13, and yet it's useless because they don't have the love of God. Then what about Rhema and the power of the Spirit? Is there a hierarchy of what should be important to believers when it comes to the love of God? God's love is always number one. And there is a hierarchy examination of something. We must check whether it's rooted in the love of God. And once it passed that test, we can check. Is it in line with the Bible, in all the doctrine of the Bible? And if it's in line with God's love, it should also be in line with the Bible. And if it's in line with the Bible, there is your rhema. The rhema of God will always flow with the nature of Jesus and nature of God. We all have seen how Sometimes people claim to be in line with the word, but it was not in line with the love of God. So we know at some point, that person is going to read the wrong thing in their life. I would say the rhema and the power of God fits underneath the love of God. If we get that equation correct, then we will get correct rhema and the correct 
What? Next question, sir. Is it possible that it is the love of God is the one deciding factor that energizes a believer to do things like prolonged fast, all night prayers, etc.? Yes, I believe so. It says in Galatians 5 uh, that faith is energized by love. Hello, Pastor. Thank you for the message today. How do I balance the application of love when dealing with unbelievers or people who might want to harm you, especially in the area of politics? The Bible tells us to be wise, you know, naive. And so even when we exercise the love of God, there's a right way to exercise the love of God. Let me give a very complex situation. Let's say you disagree with the elderly, your father or your mother. How you share the disagreement and act on something opposite from what and they would do because you listen right and wrong differently. It's mitigated by the love of God. If you were ever to correct your parents, it is not whether you correct them or not. It is how you correct them. You would never shame them in front of other people. You would never uh, rebuke them in front of other people, you might bring them aside, explain your own views, and tell them that you still love them, though you don't disagree, you don't agree with them. And if they said something wrong, did something wrong, you would still correct them so they can improve. But you do it all in a loving way. You correct without disrespect. So yes, we still can uh, balance the love of God in our dealings with unbelievers, with parents, with situations where you need to exercise the love of God. Like I say, how do you disagree? is the key to where the love is flowing. Surprisingly, you can actually correct a person and disagree with a person while still in a position of love. It says here, Matthew 10, 16, admonishes us to be wise as serpents as we are as sheep in the midst of wool. So I want to know how we can walk in love without having others walk all over us. By disagreeing without disrespecting. The key word is respect. You still give them whatever respect is due to them. It is when we disrespect a person, that's where the love disappears. And believe me, it is possible to disagree without disrespecting. Next, sir, on the topic of the love of God, how can a believer love someone or a group of people who are now bent on destroying the church or inner world? Today, around many countries, every day we see people from the other religion giving speeches on how they destroy Christians and make the world submit to their religion. Whenever I see them, I cannot comprehend how can these people be so wicked and not even know it. Now, how can the church walk in love without with this type of people? Well, there is a place 
to be silent. And there's a place to speak out. Where you don't have the opportunity to speak out, you can disagree in silence. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When everyone was commanded to bow down to the idol, they just choose not to. And in the end, the king was angry at them, commanded them to be killed. And God protected them. There are times when we silently disagree. And there are times when we vocally disagree without disrespecting a person. And may the Lord teach us when to speak out, when to be silent, and when to make our stand clear. We cannot force our opinions on people, but we can speak to them when there's an opportunity to disagree. May God give us the grace, the wisdom to always be in the position of love but still to be able to disagree without disrespecting people's viewpoints. Amen. And I see a different question here. Sir, a different question. What year would COG flood into Europe for the supergroup era? I've seen that a lot of people in the West have lost their faith. That is true. And I have strong desire to see a new line, new fire for God in Europe. I believe it's a short time more before God demonstrates His power and grace in this end time. In the days of the Ten Toes, God will establish a kingdom. We are in that time now. And I believe the kingdom of God is about to be established. We wait upon God. We wait patiently. But our faith is as big as this universe. We believe in the establishment of the kingdom of God greater than all the four kingdoms before it. The word of God is true and it will happen exactly as the Lord planned. Amen and amen. Sir, do you know Donald Trump has a video where he said 2024 would be the very last election in the United States or America. He just lied with the prophecy he gave America a year ago. Yeah, very strange. Very strange that he mentions that without realizing he is actually the main perpetrator of all the confusion that takes place. And indeed, it will be the last election of the USA before it breaks up, I can see that something will happen that will cause the states to say, we will not be part of USA. And as the states break up, it will be the most confusing time in our modern world to see the United States broken up by big generals and governors of each state and all the 51 states break up. It will break up into two and there might be some level of 
war or civil war. As a president at that time, we tried to keep everyone united, but it will not succeed. Already, some states are so unhappy that if they have a choice, they would break up. But this is what the Lord has shown many years ago. It would take place. For all of us to see in our modern world, many will be shocked. But it is part of what God allows. Praise the Lord. Any uh, concluding remarks on Pauline or any one of you? You may share forth. Amen. Yeah, Pastor, uh, as I see the questions that are coming up and the discussion and uh, also what I was uh, thinking initially, um, We all want to love like Jesus loved, and uh, but it seems that we really need also the wisdom of the Lord, because uh, mm. uh, a lot of times when we 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 love and we have the intention to do good and to help people and to express our love, um, we really need the wisdom of God to express it in the correct way. And to do it in a way that the, only the the Lord knows how to do it. And uh, so, Pastor, how do we? I mean, apart from we we are praying for the the Lord to give us more wisdom and to understand. Um, is there anything specific that we can do? You know, um, to receive more of that wisdom from God uh, that flows with love or how I mean uh, is there something that connects uh, love and wisdom together it's a good point there and I give the example of Paul when he was under the Saint Hedon Council at the end of his ministry and as he was being tried in the Sanhedrin Council, the chief priests keep calling him to be smite, to be slain. And Paul didn't know it was a chief priest. And Paul said, God will smite you. He reacted as a normal human being because he's irritated by this guy who keep on uh, saying all the nonsense about him. And then Paul immediately corrected himself. Because they say, that's a chief priest. He said, oh, I, I'm sorry about that. I didn't know that he was a chief priest. And then he quoted a verse against himself. He says, the Bible did say to respect your leaders. And so he sort of apologized without a direct apology, but he self-corrected himself. He said, oh yes, we should respect the chief priest. It's part of the fact that the chief priest is actually very evil and commanding his death. And that would be difficult. In the same way, I'm sure it was difficult for Jesus when he looked across the St. Hidden Council and the devil was possessing the chief priest. So Jesus kept silent. That's why I say, wisdom demands sometimes that we don't say anything. And wisdom sometimes demand that we say something. And to speak or not to speak. 
is sometimes a question of doing the right thing. Jesus kept silent. When there was no reason for him to speak, and no one would listen to what he says at the time of his uh, tried by Pontius Pilate or his trial by the Sanhedrin Council. No one there was wanting to listen to Jesus. So he kept quiet because at that time, words are wasted air and wasted speech. So Jesus didn't even bother to correct them. Except when they ask him questions that he has to answer. And you know, are you the son of God? And then he speaks about uh, how he already spoke those words and they commanded him to be smite. And sometimes he was silent when Pontius Pilate spoke, sometimes he spoke. And I believe if we have nothing to say or no inspiration from God, when we are in a trial, we say nothing. But Jesus promised that when you're on trial, the Holy Spirit will speak through you. And so we can trust that if God wants us to say something, He will give us something to say. If God did not give us anything to say, then we learn that silence is the most powerful speech. Because sometimes when people speak all the wrong thing, the silence that we give them is more deafening than any speech. By other times when God gives us the words to speak, then we speak. So the first area is to speak or not to speak. Wisdom will help us. The second area is to answer without disrespect. At no time did Jesus show disrespect. He seemed to honor the authorities there before him. And he just speak the truth. And when we deal with authorities, they can know whether we still respect them. Our parents, if we correct them, they know whether you still love and respect them or not. And so, to be able to love without disrespect is another quality of the spirit of wisdom within us. Mm, thank you, Outside of these two, um, the Holy Spirit wisdom will guide us. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah, indeed, like uh, we see Jesus especially, I mean, to our... I mean, if you look at it from the side, it, it looks like he's always like he's stuck between a rock and a hard place and they always try to trap him. And um, yeah, we really need the wisdom of God because sometimes situations are very difficult to, to speak the right things and to do the right things. And even like sometimes not, you know, to love somebody is also sometimes not to say or ask something where it is not the right time uh, uh, to do it. And um, indeed also sometimes not saying something may hurt yourself, you know, uh, and uh, requires uh, long suffering, which is also a part of uh, uh, being lo or loving some somebody. <laughs> yeah. So maybe before we end, uh, I'll just uh, share the scripture and we look at it. Uh, I saw something interesting. So I'll just um, share this uh, screen. Yeah. Mm. yeah, so I see that um, uh, verse 19 says, Know the love of Christ with precious knowledge that you may feel with the fullness of God. So it, it looks like um, 
you know, f- having the love of Christ, um, and this love of Christ passes knowledge. So it's something that is, you know, be beyond just uh, learning or, or knowing um, that we may be filled with the fullness of God. And it looks like uh, having the love of Christ, you know, uh, grow, then we can have the fullness of God. So, Pastor, is that a, a, a right looking at this passage? Yes, definitely. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then I saw also, as I was trying to look at uh, wisdom, uh, I found something interesting because we always pray this prayer. And, um, you know, we, we all like this part of, you know, having the spirit of wisdom, revelation, understanding, you know, having the riches. Uh, of the glory of his inheritance, exceeding greatness of his power, all that. But I, I now suddenly see that in the first part, it says that after I heard of your faith in the, the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for all the saints, then Paul talks about, uh, pray about this, uh, this prayer. So it looks like the foundation actually for getting into wisdom and revelation and all that great working of power and all that rests on uh, this faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and love for all the saints. So the, is it a, a correct also um, interpretation? Uh, yes, definitely. Mm. 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 Um, so one question here. Um, Pastor, well, I see here that he says that, um, Paul says that, I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for all the saints. So, love for all the saints is love for all the, you know, love for people, you know, love for brethren. brethren. And he says, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Why did not he Why did he not say love of God or love of, uh, love of the Lord Jesus, but he uses faith, uh, but he uses love for the saints. But to, to Jesus Christ, he says that, uh, faith in the Lord Jesus instead of using I believe it was in the context of the gospel mm. Mm. it's in the context of the gospel because for the gospel's sake he heard how they receive people who preach the word and that's a that's a good thing and how people respond to the gospel uh, all that shows their faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. So faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is also this. I mean, we can say equivalent to love of Father God. Yes, love for Jesus, of course, and His gospel, mm. and then love of the Father. Mm. Thank you, Pastor. That's all for me. There's a question coming in uh, about a dream. Ah, uh, the dream is simple. It's uh like God has given you some sort of understanding and revelation. I believe the key to opening some things in your life. Praise the Lord. Yes, and to the answer about time. Yeah. The good thing is, time is always on the side of truth. And when we are patient enough, we will see God demonstrating all that he promised. Those who are on the enemy side, they always have impatience. But those on God's side, time is on our side, and we patiently abide in him to see the works of God. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. And uh, good questions that are there. And I hope you also uh, have received the answers that we gave to you. Uh, the answers we gave about different situation is uh, to be silent or to speak. That is a question that we need to decide a lot. And secondly, uh, 
whatever we do, we need to uh, love and speak with respect. And uh, there is a way to love and speak with respect. And there's a way to do it with disrespect. And that will cause more disharmony. So there are wisdoms that we can flow into. And the Holy Spirit promised that in every situation where we are tested or tried, He says, do not think about what to speak, but the Holy Spirit will give you the answer in the right time, which we can rely on God. Praise God. Amen to those words. Uh, it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, sons and spiritual sons. The question is asked, what is the word of Christ? The word of Christ are all his teachings that he has spoken in the Gospels. Anything that we can classify as the teachings of Christ, the words that Christ spoke, they were recorded by the disciples. And that's why when the word of Christ feels us, it must enrich our lives. We worship. Amen. Let's give thanks to our God. Father, we bless you and thank you. Thank you for your love for us and thank you for your presence in our life. And today we understand that your presence in our life is equivalent to the love of God that flowed through us. May your love be perfected in us. May your presence be full and may your power be Demonstrate through us your kingdom, your third temple, your people in this day of the land. Those we bless you and we continue to declare and confess that we know we are in the days of the tentos when the kingdom of God is established. And we are willing and ready for you to establish a kingdom in our times. Let your will be done. Let your kingdom be established. We give you praise and worship. Let all your 10,000 churches be established. And let 24 hour praise and worship be established in all the countries of the world. May this whole planet be filled with your worship and be covered by the canopy of your glory. We bless you and thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, Amen. Praise the Lord and have another great week in the Lord and we meet again for all night prayer on Friday and I will share a few words or uh, exhortation before we start praying and I'll do that all of this year and also up to the 40 day fasting and pray for January the 1st to February the 9th and uh, then we will end with uh, the 40 day prayer praise the Lord be blessed, be strengthened a lot Amen, Amen. Thank you Pastor, Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.